I mean, I've always wanted to be, like as a child, was, I want to be successful. But as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an entrepreneur because I always looked up to guys like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, I don't know, if Warren Buffett, like, like those type of, of guys, right? And I think Bill Gates was on there too, but it was an interview and they were asked a question. And the question was, if you are a starting entrepreneur, what is the one skill you would have to learn or you would you know, learn to start the journey or the most important skill? And they all said sales, but I heard them saying sales. And like, I think two, three months later, I dropped out of university, went into door-to-door -door sales. Guys, what's going on? We got a new episode of the One Network here for you guys. Uh, it's going to be a big one for you outbound marketing people. I got Lawrence with me. Uh, he is a play expert, um, the founder of a company called Expand, uh, and I think he's going to have a lot of interesting knowledge for you. Lawrence, we've had a lot of people on the podcast recently that either run outbound GTM agencies um, or do a lot of things with that kind of sales BD um, tech. A lot of people obviously have used clay read a lot about it on linkedin um but we haven't gotten really anybody's take on you know how to actually use it in a business and what the actual impact of it could be so i'm very curious to uh grill you on that and hear about some of your expertise but before we even get to that do you want to give some background on how you became an entrepreneur in the first place what's the backstory yeah um well so the the origin story basically um i mean i've always wanted to be like as a child it was i want to be successful right and they kind of don't know what it means uh but as long as i can remember i wanted to be an entrepreneur because i always looked up to guys like steve jobs elon musk i don't know if warren buffett like like those type of, of guys right um right. and i mean i so so i followed those i went to university and then while i was into university um i watched the video of steve jobs warren buffett I think Bill Gates was on there too, but it was an interview and they were asked uh, a question and the question was, if you are a starting entrepreneur, what is the one skill you would have to learn or you would you know, learn to start the journey or the most important skill? Uh, and they all said sales, like without hesitation. Um, and I was like the yeah. shy introvert kids, like I, I was afraid of like being picked to answer questions, but okay. I heard them saying sales. Um, and like, I think two, three months later, I dropped out of university, went into door-to-door -door sales, and then kind of worked myself up in, in the sales world. Had a, you know, a few sidetracks. Like one time I went to, um, I, I did two weeks of university again to study, like it's called, if you translate it to English, it's SMB management. Um, but it's like, it was, yeah, it, it, it wasn't really good. So after two weeks, I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to learn a lot here. I'm just going to do sales. Then, you know, went up in sales roles, eventually ended up in recruitment. Um, then after two years, you know, in recruitment agency, um, I was like, I think I can do this better. Um, started talking with another colleague. We were both like, okay, we, we can do this better. Because like the the agency world in recruitment is, is a very high churn spray and pray, make a lot of promises and don't deliver on them. And uh, we were like, you know what, what if we build a company and then we make promises and deliver on them? Um, so we basically started doing that, start expand, start off as a recruitment company. Um, we so a recruitment company in SaaS, in tech companies, uh, and we were very, you know, um, I could say it's very specific in the, in the type of clients we worked with. And one of the questions we asked a lot was sales enablement. Like, what are you doing? Who are you using? In case you find the perfect candidate, the perfect SDR, AE, like, what does he have to work with at your company, at your startup? Uh, and we soon got the question back, like, I don't know, like, what would you recommend we use or try? And I'm all, I've always been like some sort of a tech savvy. So I love tech tools. I love automating stuff. Um, so I've set it up for expense. Uh, I know I knew the landscape, so started to help some startups, and now we we have our first clients to you know actually fully set up. I mean, outbound sales systems would basically just play with integrations. That's basically it. So 
Yeah, that's that's the origin story, and that's where we're at uh, today, or right now. Nice. Okay. So, um, tell me about like how you kind of learned outbound marketing. Like, what were some of the first campaigns that you ran, and, and how did those go? What kind of tools were you using? What kind of tactics? I mean, initially, initially, like my my first initially initially. role, yeah, was was just like not even using a tool. It was just sending cold emails, fully manual, and then just calling. That was my my first like outbound, you know, experience um, was it was also the, the first actual sales job I did after the the door to door. But then, of course, like once you once you get into it, you you start testing tools and then you you start off with the basic ones, right? You you have an Apollo, and that's basically it because you don't know any other tools. Uh, it's the main and yeah, then, it's kind of home base. Yeah, yeah. Then when I was at the recruitment agency, I was even paying for my own tools to use because, like, they were very old school recruitment uh, agencies, so they were like not paying for any tools. So I paid for my own SalesNav and my own Apollo account, just so I could automate some at stuff. The company. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. And then when Expense started, I mean, about a year ago now, I just went all in. Of you know, I knew a lot of tools because I had a lot of trials and always liked automating stuff. Um, so then I went all in, quickly figured out Clay was like, you know, the new kid on the block and tested it, was amazed with capabilities. Um, and then just basically build, expand um, a system with Clay. So the main campaign wise, the, the main campaigns I've run is, are just for expand, like building our own company. And right now we're building another campaign for, uh, you know, for one of our clients. But the uh, the main thing we try to do because we we were thinking for a long time about are we are we gonna set up like the systems like just the software just the clay or are we gonna do more uh, like a done for you solution where we'll you know set it up but kind of keep it internally and do the messaging and stuff uh, so we are mainly focused on the system part of like setting up clay integrations and then like checking relevancy and how do you personalize and then teaching it to clients so they can do it themselves. Um, but you know, it might change in the future, but for now that's, that's our focus. So how do you think, um, I, I, I can't remember exact. So I ran a, a lead gen and sort of outbound agency for five or six years. I, most of the segmentation and stuff that we did was manual. So we had a VA come in, right? Write out the custom fields. Then you plug that into an Apollo or Mailshake or smart lead or whatever. Um, what do you think the, you know, how do you think play or has, has kind of changed that game? I mean, like anything you can do manually by looking, like browsing on the internet, you, you can automate in play. So any segmenting you would do manually, like yeah, anything, if you can find it on the internet and you could do it manually, like you can do it in play. You just have to figure out why. So I think it's in that sense, like really changing the game. Um, like, I don't know, for example, well, most recruitment agencies, what they like used to do and probably are still doing is just look at jobs and then just send out, because that's the most efficient way, because it takes too long to, you know, go looking, yeah, to go look any deeper, basically. But right now in Crave, for example, for expense, we, we check job postings, but then we check, you know, we check total headcount. We see how that's changed over the last six months, 12 months. We see if they have, uh, how many recruiters there are, how many job postings they have in total, then like a ratio of how many jobs do they have per recruiter, because, you know, to kind of gauge workload. Uh, we also check if they have open recruitment positions, because, you know, if the ratio sucks and they're also looking for a recruiter and they have a job posting we can help with, that's probably going to be like, a lead we want to reach out to ASAP because they're overworked and I mean they're all looking for a solution so you, you can just do way more and then you have the like typical stuff of like funding and stuff um, but it's in my opinion like the creative things you can figure out um, like gauging workloads for like recruitment and whatever that really you know sets clay apart because it would take but like anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes, I'm guessing to, you know, check how many recruiters company has, how many vacancies have opened into all that stuff, basically. Have you ever ran into errors or, or 
situations where the data or some of the fields that Toy has merged didn't come out as good as if you had done it manually? Yeah, I mean, there, there's always an error margin. Um, we, we try to set up this like formulas in Cray are free, so you can, you know, build in formulas that have like an error check basically. Um, like for example, a common one is like when you go from a company to, to a person or to a contact, you know, sometimes it picks a contact from a different company because it's an AI that's looking and maybe personals already left or whatever, but then you can just quickly, you know, build in a formula that checks hey, the person that we just found, where does he work? And is that the same company as the company we want to reach out to? So you kind of have to build some fail saves to make sure that indeed, like when you get an error, you figure out you have the error before the outbound gets sent out. Got it. Um, what, you know, for people who are unfamiliar, give me some like industry or specific sort of niche examples of a clay use case that worked out really well. Um, well, I mean, for us, it's, it's the one I just mentioned is looking, you know, at the, the workloads and yeah, yeah, that's, that's for us, there was a, a major shift in our mind because it, you know, it allowed us to do much less work on researching and on, you know, cause we, we, we wanted to position ourselves as like quality and expert in the market and not like these spray and pray agencies that are out there. Um, so, right. you know, setting up play to really, you know, drill down on the quality aspect was really well for us. Um, but I mean, we're set, so the funny thing is the, the first clients we have, they, uh, the first, so they have their sales consultancy. So they, but they also do recruitment. So the work, first workflow we're setting up with them right now is just basically the one we're already using. Um, so the examples I can give are, are mainly towards recruitment, um, or at least that's, that's, you know, the use cases I run play with. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, I think if you have a, if you, if you, it's, it's just figure out what the problem is you're trying to solve and then are there any proxies to look for, for the problem you are solving? Like in recruitment, it's easy. It's just, you look at the workload of the recruiters, you look at the open positions and, and all that stuff to figure oh, out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's the game. It's like, what problem do we solve and what proxies for those problems can we look for on the internet and then figuring out how to get clay to look for them. Nice. Outside of uh, like the recruiting use case, like how can you see any examples in a straight B2B use case, like selling a high ticket SaaS or a, a marketing agency or something like that? Like what, how, how would you see it? Like what's a, a use case example for a, like I think I can picture the recruiting use case easy because there's a lot of information and things that are technical that you have to know, like the number of job posts. But like, what about a sales specific use case for a B two B company? Yeah. Um, well, an example of let's pick a marketing software or a marketing agency. Um, always sort of depends on, of course, like what you are specifically selling. If it's like SEO, like SEO, like what's what's a specific. Um, but you can check, for example, you can check how much traffic does the websites have, what ads do they have running, like how many ads do they have running at the moment. You can check the, the speech um, at which the pages are loading. Um, you can also score on SEO with the, the SEMrush um, integration. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't run a marketing agency myself or a marketing software, but I'm assuming like if you can check the page feed, you can also check by the way, which, uh, which softwares they're already using. Um, so if there are any like SEO softwares or whatever they're using, um, technology, but you, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I would assume like a, a mix of those which would probably get you very close in figuring out if, you know, one, they're investing in what you're selling. Um, and then two, if they, you know, might have a problem, like is the site extremely low, um, did, how did traffic change over the last few months, um, the ads they are running, like, are they running any ads? Like, uh, are they already investing in advertising? Um, and job post, of course, it's, it's always a trigger to look for, like, are they hiring marketers? Cause that's, that's an easy one. Um, you can also look for keywords. You can check out blog posts. 
um, see if they mention anything. Um, what else can you do? Um, I mean, it kind of depends on the problem, I guess, but it's just figuring out, like, basically, if you had unlimited time, what would you go look for manually and then just make Clay look for it for you? Got it. Okay. Um, do you feel like the proliferation or people using these tools is lowering the amount of ROI that people get off of outbound, or do you feel like that it's making it more competitive? What, what do you feel like the overall impact is on the success of outbound campaigns? Yeah, um, I, I think it's lowering it, um, especially with like the, I mean, right now the, the ability to do outbound at scale is like, it's the bar for entry is so low. I think almost any company is doing a lot of outbound. Um, so competition is getting um, higher and higher and, and it's getting, I think it's getting more and more difficult to, to actually land outbound. Um, that's why I think you should always have like the, the inbound led part in your outbound, like create a personal brand to, to add to your outbound, um, to, you know, sort of build trust and, you know, get impressions, get them to see your, your content, get them to see you, uh, because it makes the email way warmer and makes it land way better. Um. But yeah, I'm curious how that's gonna evolve. Because you see a lot of SaaS companies right now are doing like the, the community-led build thing. Like Clay's in, is like a prime example of this. They went really, really heavy in affiliates and Clay is just like everywhere on LinkedIn right now. Um, I don't even know if they do outbound themselves, but I'm assuming they don't. Yeah. I'm it's assuming it's like all high. Yeah, all content. yeah. 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 yeah, so I definitely, it's like, it's the whole debate of like, is outbound dying, yes or no? And I don't think it's that, because I think it, can, it works still, and, and I think it can still work. Um, but it's definitely dying in the sense that it's getting harder and harder to make it work. Like, when I started out, like, manually, it was way easier to get a reply. And my emails were much better. Like, they were manual, but my skill was so low that it was probably a badly automated email i just typed it out right um so so i just think yeah it's getting harder and the you know the, the reply rates are dropping i i think you need to build trust and you do that by building a personal brand and that's hard to scale hard to do but i think that's the way forward and the way like if we extrapolate for the next five years i think the companies that are building a personal brand right now are probably the ones that are gonna you know, get the most customers or, or win in the, in the, yeah. uh, maybe SaaS, but like win in the SaaS landscape at least. Yeah. A lot of people are saying that. I think that it's more valid probably than ever. And you, you kind of need the inbound or branding to even succeed on outbound, right? Because people are like looking up your company and uh, Googling you and whatnot. Um, how are, so with your company, like what, how, how have you been growing the company? What's like been your strategy for, getting the company off the ground. Are you getting your clients yes. outbound? Yeah, so initially we were like fully outbound. We we were, I don't know, I started posting on LinkedIn in October, I think, um, and like consistently. So in October I was like, okay, LinkedIn seems the way to go and I want to do this inbound led. I want to I want to build trust. I want to build personal brand because inbound led, I, I had never heard of inbound led outright at that point. I was just like, I think personal brands will help us a lot. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then I started posting consistently every work day from then on. Uh, but it took a long while for it to actually get, you know, enough engagement and enough traffic to really get inbound leads. Um, I think even now it's like still, it's there in the sense that we get inbound leads, but it's, it's not there that we can stop doing outbounds. We, we're still doing outbounds. Um, so yeah, initially all outbound. Now it's sort of a that mix between. Yeah. What's what's your team set up? What does the team look like? I mean, right now we're like startup startup. So it's me and then my co-founder. So I'm doing the business development and like the operations side, and he's doing the recruitment fulfillment side. How did you meet the co-founder? We we were colleagues at the uh, the recruitment agency. And did you think, like, what, what went into sort of thinking 
you know, I'm saying that in that chat, did you realize that you had like differing skill sets or different kind of synergistic ways of operating? Yeah. yeah, sort of like, I'm naturally more like introverted and I, I love like systems and tech and um, the operation sides of business and the finance sides, I, I love it. Um, he's like naturally way more extroverted. Like if we go to an event or something, like I'm sort of the guy that's like more in the background, like talking to a few people I know. And, and he's the guy just going out there and like meeting everybody that's there. So um, we're, we're very complimentary in, in that sense to uh, yeah. say the least. So oh. it's also very easy to be like out of the operations and then you just meet all the candidates there are. Have there been any big challenges in, in the company thus far since you've been running it? Like what have been the big, the biggest issues or things that you've needed to overcome? Um, well, in, initially it was product market fit, um, which seems weird for a recruitment agency. Um, but we wanted to set up our business model in, in a way that's different because we, we didn't want to be considered like another recruitment agency just doing like the no queue, no pay, high volume stuff. Um, so we started off with a business model that was like some sort of revenue sharing because we only do go-to-market roles, uh, mostly sales, but also like marketing and support. Um, and we're like, we'll place a sales rep and then you only give us a percentage that they're bringing in for you, um, which we thought was like an amazing idea. Yeah. Uh, but the feedback in on practice, it was basically, yeah, yeah. Um, the feedback was basically just, yeah, that's like great and stuff, but I'm quite confident I can figure out which candidate is like the good one and, and is going to get all the results. So best case scenario, I'm overpaying you. Um, yeah. So you're like, yeah, makes sense, but it's no risk. And then they're like, well, we're not worried about risk. We're worried about overpaying you. Um, so we, we tried something else. And now what we basically have set up is we, we have a retainer because we only work with five clients. Uh, and then it's just because mainly startup focused. Um, it's basically like a monthly fee instead of like a big, like upfront cost. Like the, the candidate starts, you pay monthly. If for whatever reason he stops within those 12 months, our fee stops, we find a new one. New one starts, our fee continues. Got it. So that was a major one. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, we're a startup, so, and we're both human. So there, there have been some mistakes along the way, um, which is, you know, I think, three or four months ago we, we had a search for a head of sales um but it was so the they were replacing the the current head of sales but he didn't know yet um so it was you know a confidential search um, and then we wrote out a vacancy which you know we thought was confidential we, we weren't there weren't any names in it or whatever uh but somehow the head of sales found out and like I really we were fucking screwed yeah, yeah that, that, that didn't go great. Um, they didn't go great. So, yeah, there, there was like an inflection point because, you know, head of sales is like high position. So our fee was quite high too. Uh, but we were just instantly like, hey, we'll repay you the retainer uh, and we'll work for free to get this role filled in. Um, and because I'm like, this is the fun part about like customer centricity, like um, with many conversations about this, but it's like, such a common knowledge but not common practice thing like everybody says they're like customer centric and i want to be customer centric but then when it comes down to it like because in my eyes customer centric means you make decisions that are good for the customer like that's what it means um uh, and in practice that's like rarely actually true um but yeah basically so we really funded them offered to work for free eventually we still placed the head of sales and they were like well, we don't really feel great about, you know, having you done all this work for free. So I'll pay you 50%. Uh, and now we get like still half of the fees. Nice. Cool. Yeah. What, are you, what, what, what are your uh, goals for the business in the next three to five years? Yeah, that's a uh, hard one. First time um, business owner. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're looking to like hire our first employees like somewhere the end of this year, starting next year. Um, but um, so the, the main fear I have is the, the like dilution of talent because I want to 
be like a really Involved. good agency. Yeah. yeah, I just don't want to. I don't want to get bloated. Like I want. I want to get bigger, but also I want to get bigger because we are the best and we're getting better. Right, not getting um, worse. I get what you're saying. Yeah, it happens to a lot yeah. of agencies in, in a similar space. So. Yeah, especially recruitment because I've been on the like recruitment agency that was mm-hmm. like. Yeah, yeah, um, but ambition wise, like I want to get as good and as big as possible, and hopefully, because right now we're focused on Belgium slash Europe, and we want to move to the US because you know Texas startups. Um, so uh, the big ambition is is to move to the US uh, and you know become like the go to go to market agency uh, for tech startups, and it's like helping them recruit their teams and setting up the sales systems. Cool. Lawrence, um, where can people find you? What's the best way for them to get in touch if they're in the market um, or or even if they just need like some clay help or support? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So that's uh, yeah. Lawrence and then Nash is like N-Y-S. Uh, you can always look me up there um, or expand. And expand is by the way, it's E-X-P-N-D. Like it's no A. Because, you know, eventually we'll buy the name with the A in it. But for right now, we, we, we always have to explain it's like it's without the A because else you won't find us. Nice. Cool. Lawrence, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is the one hour. Thanks, guys. Good. Storm.